Okay, let's let's I guess get started in here. Um, first question, I, I guess comment. Uh, last class, uh, Fahad, I guess was here doing the uh, introduction to Python and stuff like that. Uh, how did people? How, how did he do? Who people thinks he did well? Who thinks he did bad? Okay, no one says bad. Um, same thing on TV World. Um, so. Any questions left over or raised as a result of uh, the Python lecture from last time? I will warn you that we're going to have another Python lecture uh, a week uh, next Thursday. So I guess a week from today, I'll be talking more about machine learning libraries and things like that. Um, any questions? OK. Um, other things. First, I'd like to start by asking about the homework. How many people have started on the homework? First here uh, live. Okay, some of you. Anyone? Okay, some people are twitching on the uh, video, so that's good. Um, any questions or anything interesting come up on the homework? Again, I'd like to discuss. You know, I like discussing it. If there's anybody who saw anything unusual in one of the data sets or uh, had a question about what the assignment is. Any questions or comments about the assignment? OK, I am going to encourage people to uh, get started on it. And uh, hopefully, we'll have something to talk about it next time. OK, fair enough. OK, the, the final announcement that I'd like to make is a semi-personal one. Um, the uh, I am. Are any of you guys uh, on Hacker Rank? Okay, familiar with Hacker Rank, which is a uh, video, video interviewing thing. Oh, actually, before my thing, I got a good question. Should we choose random weights? Okay, randomly choose weights while creating the formula for computing power. And um, I guess. So I guess the question is, how do you, the bigger question is, how do you try to come up with a measure of how powerful a computer is, you know, which is one of the things I'm asking you. And um, when you say random weights, I get nervous. Random to me means something that you come from tossing, tossing dice, okay? And that's probably not the right way to do it. Um, arbitrary, okay, meaning, you know, is maybe a better word. Okay, do I just make up numbers and try them? And um, to a certain extent, uh, that I, I'm, I'm asking you to use your judgment here. Okay, so randomness is not using your judgment. Arbitrary is using your judgment. How might you come up with a reasonable uh, model, by the way? Okay, does anyone have a principled idea? Not that you have to use it, but let's just have a discussion. I like having these discussions. How would you come up with a principled discussion about idea of how you might uh, combine RAM and, let's say, number of cores? Okay, is there any is there any basis for making a decision like that? Okay, the task is, I gather, and um, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, let me just say yes. Um, uh, th there is a, uh, what you call it, a, a I ask you on the pro uh, project to come up with a score for how powerful a computer is, right? And um, part of it is you have RAM, you have number of processors, right? Is there any kind of a, a principled way you could do this? Okay, that's what I'd be looking for. Okay, yeah, what do you say? So I would say a computer is only as strong or powerful as the slowest component. So if I know the processor is better than the RAM, the bottleneck would be the RAM. Um, so one argument is that you would want to find out which is the least powerful of the thing. Yeah. So if you have a super duper computer with a billion cores and uh, and and sixteen k of memory, that would again I am old enough to have programmed computers with sixteen k of memory on it. But uh, actually, 64K to be precise. But, uh, but 
only 16K, 16K of that was for the operating system, so you had to deal with 48K. That was the smallest I remember dealing with. So maybe you would look for the min. That is arguably a, a, a way of coming up with a score. Does anybody else have a principle for how you would combine these things? Okay. Anybody on TV land? So I'm just going to say something which, again, you don't have to do this for the assignment, but what kind of thing would occur to me when this, I was asking about this? What is the universal measure of power in the world? The answer is dollars. Okay, does everybody kind of agree that, um, that, that one way to measure how valuable something is is in dollars? And so I might be thinking in terms of what is the cost of such a thing? Okay, and if I knew something about how memory was, was, and I knew something about how processors were, maybe that's a way of making it, uh, you know, assuming that, you know, you know, the person is not going to buy a thing with a billion cores and 16K of memory. Okay, you would figure how much would it cost to buy such a thing? That's one measure. The other possibility is you just say, no, nah, I think RAM is twice as important as... But then how do you compare when you're overpowered or underpowered? Okay. So this is something to think about. Okay. But, but there are different ways of doing it. And if you want to start by saying, I just think I look at the RAM, I say multiply the RAM by 35 and the uh, number of cores by 106. Okay. That gives you something. We'll talk about scoring functions later and how you come up with them. Okay, that's going to be in a couple of weeks. But, um, but that's my initial thinking. Any other questions about the homework? Okay. And, uh, Professor? Yes. Do you have any recommendations for, where, for sources or literature that we could look for, for to see how RAM and the processor cores interact? Okay, so... so I know nothing about how RAM and process, processor cores interact. My guess is this is why God invented Google, okay? And that for, on some level, um, there is probably, you, you, you should know something. But on the other hand, you should probably, it's probably overkill to, um, you know, to go and, uh, and, you know, think, oh, my God, I've got to look deep into the architectures of these things and, you know, um, have any of you ever done these, uh, uh, I heard them, they were called Fermi problems, but these ones where you're, you're told to try to make up, you know, how many, page, how many pages of books are there in the Stony Brook Library? These kind of things, or, you know, how many uh, teaspoons does it take to fill up a bathtub? These kind of questions here. And, you know, what you find is, you you know, have, have, have anybody seen these kind of questions that come up on interviews and things like that? Can you make a rough estimate of things? Okay. And um, what you find when you do these is you make a rough estimate. If you think about it a tiny bit, you get pretty close to the right answer. Okay. So I believe, do I believe John Hennessy could give you a better trade-off between processors and RAMs? if you, he thought deeply about this and had to come up with a score. But I, I'm imagining that with a little tiny bit of your own understanding, you can come up with a reasonably principled way to do it. Okay. And, um, you know, principled enough to be interesting. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So again, I think the data scientist has to, you know, be able to kind of be, not become an expert on something, but, but, you know, there, there's knowing nothing, then there is knowing a tiny bit, and then there is being an expert. If you know a tiny bit, you get a lot of the way, okay, towards where you want to go. Okay? Any other questions about the homework problem? The other thing that I'm going to say here very often is don't get hung up on things. If the answer is, oh, my God, I've got to first get my PhD in computer architecture before I do this. That, that's wrong, right? The first thing to do is to, what would be the, 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 
if you have to divide between two things, actually, let me come up with another principled way to do it. If you're dividing between two things, what is the best, you know, there's this question, how do we decide the weights? If you have two things, RAM and processor, how do you decide a reasonable weight between them? Half and half is a good first start, right? Is it perfect? Probably not. Is it better than zero, one? Probably, okay. The bigger question is kind of, I'll probably say is, what does it mean? How do you convert them so that they're of the same scale, okay? And there are techniques that, you know, I'll probably talk about at some point soon called like things like Z-scores that are probably ways of doing these things, okay? But don't obsess with it. Go ahead, try something, see what happens, and move on. Any questions? Any other questions about the homework? Okay, good. Okay, so I was about to say that um, some of you may be uh, on Hacker Rank or, or know about Hacker Rank. The Hacker Rank is having a virtual career fair uh, on Monday, okay? And uh, you can sign on over the web. And the only reason I am mentioning this is I happen to be the keynote speaker there. And I am going to be talking about what advice would I give my students, okay? And you guys are my students. So if you want my advice, you can go there, okay? If not, you don't have to. Any questions about that? What time is it on Monday? It is, at, I believe it is at 1, it, it's, I think it's 10 p.m. Pacific, meaning 1 p.m. here, okay? So um, you guys should try to, you know, sign on if you're interested. Okay, they will, this will not be on the quiz, so you don't have to worry about that. Any questions? Okay, what I'd like to talk about now, um, otherwise, is um, I want us to finish up what we had thought, uh, one bit of mathematical kind of prerequisites here that are, uh, in, I, I want to just make sure we, we cover. And that has to do with what logarithms are. Now, um, I teach logarithms in my algorithms class every year. And I give them four reasons why they need to know about logarithms. And here I want to give you three or four reasons why you need to know about logarithms. And it turns out, interestingly, none of them are the same reasons. Okay, so this is one thing I found kind of amusing. What is a logarithm? A logarithm is it's the inverse exponential function. Again, I know you've seen this, but I want to make sure you feel it in your gut. The logarithm is defined, okay, why is the logarithm of base b of x if b raised to the y is equal to x, okay? So um, the exponential is a fast-growing function. b to the y should be fast-growing. The log, okay, base b of something is slow-growing, okay? That's one property of it. Now, why are we going to use logarithms in here? One reason why we're going to use logs, again, you guys, you know, take an algorithms class, you know about divide and conquer, and you know about all that kind of stuff. But here, um, one reason people use logs, okay, if you go into the hall of our building, the main hall upstairs, you'll see a nice display of slide rules. Okay, does anyone know what a slide rule is? Well, again, back in the days when I was programming on that computer with 48K of memory on it, okay? I was also taught in high school how to use a slide rule. What was a slide rule? It was a mechanical calculator, okay? It multiplied numbers by sliding, um, you know, you had this thing and you slid it back and forth. What? Not, an, not like an abacus, okay? Well, an abacus is a different thing. Abacuses were good for adding things up, okay? Slide rules were great for multiplying things, okay? And if you go upstairs, you'll see one. And how did you do multiply on a slide rule? Again, all kinds of state-of-the-art stuff I want to teach you in this class. Well, they were two slides that were log-scale things, okay? And what was true about logarithms that you may remember the, the 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 fundamental thing was that the log of x times y is equal to the log of x plus the log of y 
Does everybody remember that? I'm assuming you've got a, a particular base. Yeah? Uh, they say that the screen is not visible. Probably zoom out using the control screen. The screen is not visible. From the camera there. Okay, so you, I think... Let me just make... Oh, okay. Wait a second. Okay. Now, is this different than in the past? No. I'm seeing some yes, some no's. Okay. Um, I am, okay, so I'm doing the exact same thing as, as usual to, 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 to get that. Um, maybe I'll try to write on a uh, different part of the screen. Okay, but keep me, keep me honest. It's not the laptop camera. It is the usual camera. Um, okay. Exactly why this is. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to. What? Uh, is there something that you need to change in settings here in order to. Oh. Yeah. Uh, web, web, is it WebCon? Is that what's happening? Or the VideoCon? No. Okay. So we need to go for the wide light. Why did I And now what I did. What about did that change anything? Yes, it did. Okay, everyone's good. Very good. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to this now. So does everyone remember that the log of x times y is equal to the log of x times plus the log of y? It's a way of converting a multiplication, which was a hard thing to do to addition, which was an easy thing to do. Addition can be done by connecting two rulers next to each other and measuring how long it is in some sense. That's why the slide rule works, okay? What does this matter to us? In, um, what you call it, various points in the semester, like with like methods the like the naive Bayes and other methods, you sometimes have to compute the probability of rare things. The probability of rare things, if there is independence, comes from multiplying a chain of other probabilities. A probability is, is between zero and one. What happens when you multiply two probabilities together? What do you get? A number that's between zero and one, but more importantly, a lesser number, okay? And, um, you know, when you compute a long chain of probabilities, it is quickly going to go to zero and mess with the numerical precision of what you're dealing with. It'll immediately get lost and, and the number means nothing. But what do we know? We know that, the prob that um, if the product of the probabilities, we think of that as some value b to the p, P is going to be the sum of the logarithms, okay? So if B is the base of our logarithm, okay? We can, instead of multiplying probabilities, sum up log probabilities, okay? And if we really want a probability of that at the end of it, we can uh, multiply, we, we can raise it to the bth power. But even if we don't, we can compare two of these things. Okay, because if you have, want to compare two probabilities, okay, you know, if you have the sum, the sum of the logs, that is going to be, uh, basically give you the information of the multiplication. Any questions about that? So when you're multiplying long chains of probabilities, don't think of them instead sum up logarithms. Any questions? Another reason why logarithms come up a, a lot has to do, again, when we think about data, uh, that is, or ratios. Um, again, as I talked about um, before, when we talked about the geometric mean, okay, often people will have ratios in their data. Actually, the, in the data set we have now, were there any ratios of things? I don't know if any field was a ratio of things. Okay. Is there a natural way to represent data as a ratio in anything you're doing? One way to represent computer power might be to say a generic computer has power um, one, 
Okay, if you talk about an average computer or a median computer, and you can now talk then about or how powerful are you compared to a media, uh, the, the average computer, right? The ratio of you to the real, to, to, to a representative computer gives you a ratio. That's actually a natural thing, right? If you have, have the generic computer, your ratio is one. If you have your ratio of a, a, a half as powerful, it's a half, twice as powerful, it's two. It's not alien to have beta that are ratios that, that are perfectly meaningful things. Except that you have to remember that twice, as I said, twice as much is the same as half as much when you talk about ratio in terms of how weird it is, okay? One way to think about that is better than thinking about the ratios themselves, often it pays to talk about the log of the ratios. What is the log of one? Zero, right? If it's a base 10 log, what is the log of 10? One. What is the log base 10 of one tenth? Minus one, right? So, so logarithms have the property that they treat both sides equally, okay? And this is kind of an important thing to kind of, you know, grok. I know this, maybe this sounds simple, but let's take a look at this. Here I have some ratio data that one of my students once plotted for me. Where is the outlier point? Does anybody see an outlier on the plot on the left? Does anybody see an outlier point? What is the outlier point? Wow, that's got to be amazing. Wasn't that weirder than any time slot at all? This is showing somehow data about how much um, power was used at one time versus another. That's kind of what this is. It's a ratio of, of power now versus power yesterday or something like that. Is this the outlier? Of course not. Okay. Look what happened when you plotted ratios. How much space is there for positive ratios where something gets bigger than anything else? There is a lot of space. How much space is there for something that gets smaller? Okay, only this little teeny tiny space. Does everybody see that? Now, when I plot the log of these data, Okay, the log of these ratios. Now, where is the outlier? This is the exact same data that you saw before. Where was the outlier? Okay, the outliers are suddenly out here, right? They were there all along, but because you insist on treating ratios as ratios, you can't appreciate that. Does everybody see that? So logarithms on ratio data is, is generally a good thing. Okay, any questions about why? Do people see why? People understand that? So every time we're computing a geometric mean or anything to do with geometric mean, you suggest doing a logarithm for the plotting? Well, presumably a geometric mean, remember, if we remember what a geometric mean was, that multiplied the things instead of averaging them, right? What if you take the log of that thing? The log of a product was, remember, the sum of the logs. In some sense, this is the same idea as was why we kind of thought the geometric mean was interesting, right? Okay. But what I'm saying here is that when you're dealing with ratios, it is often better to deal with the logs of ratios. Any questions? Now, this is probably maybe a little bit less true if the ratios are always have a certain property, if it's always the bigger over the, the smaller over the bigger, then that's a better behaved thing than where they are arbitrary, okay? But, um, but uh, anyway, any questions about that? Okay, so that's another reason we care about logarithms. A, a third reason, I guess the one, a final, reason any questions at home or on tv i mean okay um another reason to take logarithms is that a lot of variables have do not have a natural beautiful bell shape t 
to them. Okay. Um, a lot of data turns out to be power law distributed, and we'll talk more about that in a, in a small number of weeks. But things like income is, uh, or wealth, wealth is something that is power law distributed, okay? And if you're gonna use the power law variable as a, uh, a power law has the property that there are a small number of things that have ungodly larger values, than um than than the median okay that's one of the the hallmarks of a a power law okay and what does that mean well that means if you do things like take the average okay obviously the outlier has a big impact on the average um you know often what you what's much better to make it more meaningful would be um to, if you take the log of a variable that's power law Suppose instead of having the wealth in your model as a, power, as, as a variable, what if you take the log of the wealth? Now, if you're comparing me to Bill Gates, okay, even in his now diminished state, okay, and you guys to Bill Gates, we both look like tiny, tiny ants. Does everybody agree with that when it comes to wealth? Okay, and anything you want to say basically there's no difference between me and you okay now in fact i'm proud to tell you there is a difference between me and you you guys are poor okay at this point in your life i have had i've worked for a living for 30 years i was put a little aside okay if you take the log of my of our wealth you guys are still poor right okay I, my number of logs between your wealth and my wealth and Bill Gates' wealth, I'm about in the middle there, somewhere in the middle there, okay? And so if you take the log, there is some sensitivity to a variable like this, which there wouldn't be when it came to take looking at the whole variable. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, could I know an instance where you wouldn't take a logarithm? What? Could I know an instance where you wouldn't want to take a logarithm? Well, you've got a power law. First of all, again, when you say, do I know an instance? Is it possible? Do you do any of these statistical treatments are things that are judgments for you based on your application and stuff like that? You know, when shouldn't you take a logarithm of your power of your variable when you fill out your taxes? Bill Gates would love to instead report the log of his income instead of his income. Right. So the answer is yes, there are times when maybe not. But I will tell you that that for, you know, when you're dealing with a power law variable, the distribution is often better behaved if you take the log of it. So here is an example. OK, if you take a look at the thing on the left, this is a typical power law like distribution. If you think of it as in terms of income, very few people get really zero income. OK, um, you know, uh, very right, people get typically really get zero. There is a peak, probably fairly close to the median. I mean, that's you know the, of, of how many people have that income. And there's a long tail. If you take the log of this thing, what does the log have a bigger effect on? Logs take big numbers and knock them down smaller, right? So the guys at the end, the Bill Gateses of the world, they are going to get knocked down then you will typically end up with a better distribution. If you wanted the question, how do you know when you shouldn't take the log of this thing? If after you take the log of this thing, the distribution looks funny, then that might very well be, okay? Is there a power law in the income of graduate students? If I knew that the data was all on graduate students and you're trying to figure out what is the, now maybe there is, power maybe graduate student income isn't power law distributed right and uh you know so again typically you look at it but if the distribution looks better it probably is better any questions about logarithms okay any questions about anything okay what i'd like to do now is to go to the uh oh trouble now we got trouble Okay, let's try this. Um, okay, now I'd like to go to the uh, what's basically the next lecture topic.
which is on um, where does data come from? Okay, we've talked about preliminaries, we talked about correlations, we talked about logarithms. One thing about data science is that it's about data. And so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about it. So um, one thing that, it, again, that, that, you know, this homework assignment is going to hopefully start to teach you to and expose you to is the art of data, data munging. What is data munging? Well, data munging is typically about, you know, taking your data set and formatting it so it's right, extracting what's meaningful, cleaning it up, okay? Um, and again, if you say, what is the exciting life of a data scientist? Do they spend their, all their time building machine learning models and stuff? No, they spend most of their life uh, cleaning and reformatting their data, okay? Um, and the ones that don't clean and, and reformat their data usually just spend their time complaining that there's not, no data available for what they need, okay? Usually, um, you, know, you, you know, there's an art to finding a relevant data set, okay, and thinking about what might be a relevant data set and how to prep it a little bit that, uh, you know, it's not on some level rocket science and yet is kind of an important thing. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the technology issues and before I talk into where data sets come from. So um, when it comes to wrangling and munging data, the main language that people use, I would say it's, it's pretty clear these days is Python. And you guys are using that, and so I don't need to introduce it to you. Any of you guys ever use R? Okay, so I'm seeing maybe about half the people here twitching. I'm seeing a couple of hands out on, uh, what you call it, out on the in TV land. R is a language of for, that's used for statisticians, okay? And um, it's, you know, st statisticians also work with data. Historically, they didn't work with as much data as, you know, Google or, or computer scientists or something like that. So, um, but if you need a language for doing things that statisticians care about, then R can be a very good thing. Um, statisticians care about visualizing data. There are often more intricate, um, you know, uh, tools or, or, or for visual, for certain kinds of visualization. For certain kinds of specialized data, there might be special packages for it in R. Um, they, they, they also, if you're interested in doing things like statistical tests of significance, you're more likely to find that in R than in Python. Although by R can, um, what you call it, there are ways of calling R for Python. So you should be able to know that if there's something esoteric in statistics you want that isn't that you can't find a library for you have some hope of using R. Are there any people who like R and, uh, or why did you use R? It was, well, some teacher made me do it. That's not, is there any experience people have with R? That they like it, that they recommend it? Uh, yeah. Plot 9 library of R is uh, better for- Which library? You say there's one library you like? Uh, the Plot 9. It's actually quoted in Python recently, but then it used to be on R, and it is very good for our statistical visualization. Okay, so he's claim, saying that there's a particular visualization library. Again, if it was something a statistician would have done, they would have done it, built, built the package in R, okay? So you should be aware of it um, and maybe play around with it. Um, what other languages are, any other R fans here, okay? Again, it's a different model, I think. So it does take, you know, it, it looks a little weird, okay? But, um, but it's, it, it, anyway, it's a, it's a thing to know about. MATLAB, I'm imagining some of you have used. Um, if you want to do a lot of computations that are basically just things on matrix operations and some machine learning, um, you know, basically methods will so basically will reduce to matrix operations. Sometimes people get excited about using Mat MATLAB. Um, there are people who work as big data engineers, 
Okay, somebody is writing this the 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 stuff at Twitter that is analyzing all the Twitter feed, okay, and managing it and doing all the back end infrastructure. These things are typically written in you know traditional CS languages like Java and C, because efficiency is sort of becomes a big deal when you're really writing building infrastructure. Um, I happen to be a fan um, for maybe. Of, of Mathematica, personally, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, you know, if you're doing something that involves a lot of symbolic math, or, uh, you know, use of these, you know, symbolic math, um, you know, and a mix of different things, I, I, I kind of like Mathematica, um, but that's a specialized taste. One thing that, that you should not be ashamed to use as a as a data scientist necessarily is excel typically uh you're going to want to interactively play with a data set okay if it's a modest sized data set putting it in something like excel and manipulating it a little bit is not necessarily a terrible thing their graphs are ugly compared to what you can do with python and certainly with r and stuff like that but for interacting with and exploring with things Excel is certainly a, a perfectly reputable thing. Any questions? Okay. Now, one thing that I, one reason I liked Mathematica was that that was kind of the first, as far as I could tell, um, you know, popular system that uh, you could program with a notebook environment. And, uh, by now, I think everybody should be familiar with the Jupyter notebooks that we're going to be using in Python. You know, the notebook environment is for data science. And first of all, it's always kind of a cool thing. It's kind of cool that you can mix the code and the data and, and pictures and, and documentation and all that. But for, for data science, it turns out to be more important than in other areas because you're often kind of, typically the product of a data science study is, a, is an analysis. And the analysis required using some programs, use, you know, building some, some, some software to do some analysis. It involved taking a data set. It involved doing various forms of, of treatment to that data, producing some plots. And, and so somehow the notebook enables you to keep all this stuff together. Okay, so one reason we like about uh, notebooks is that they kind of produce something that should be documented. Sometimes I look at students' notebooks and all I see are runs of code, and that's kind of, you know, defeats in some sense the point. You should have some kind of documentation explaining what you're actually doing. You should, for each one of your routines, probably have little demos and test cases. So you know that it's actually working, okay? And that's one of the great things about these notebooks. But for data science, the thing that's kind of most important is that a, a notebook gives you some hope that the results that you present at the end of the line are reproducible, okay? One thing that is bad is that um, people often take a data set and, uh, you know, you guys, let's say that you guys are starting to work on this. And you guys are probably going to go through this and you're going to say, oh, you know, in cleaning it up, maybe some of these rows look bad. I'm going to delete the rows and I'm going to go do something. I'm going to edit this part by hand. And, and then what if I told you, okay, you know, it's great. Microsoft just released a new data set, same format, but they gave you some extra data. Okay. You want to be able to go and run through your, your, your data through this process, right? And typically people, you know, I guess in the old days, if you think of it as just you're trying to do an analysis on a data set, people often do all kinds of things like edit rows by hand and delete them, okay? Well, if you delete them and they then change the data set or update the data set, you haven't learned anything, right? Or if you're going and you're doing your analysis and then you talk to your buddy and they said, oh, there's this, there's this, there's this different method for cleaning. 
okay? You, you, you often want to go to the beginning of your processing again and go and redo that part. It's important that kind of your whole pipeline be documented. First of all, if anyone looks at your results at the end, you report, you know, I've done, an, I've done my data science analysis and the earth is flat, okay? Now, you know, someone may question that conclusion, okay? They'll say, oh yeah, prove it on this data. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just, you know, maybe I'm now lecturing rather than, than teaching. Okay, but this, but understand that that you're going to have to um, what you call it. Um, re often people need to reconstruct the steps that go on in what you did with the data, and if you do it in a notebook and you do it with a kind of a pipeline idea, where if you have a new data set, it's just a question of changing the uh, command at the top. You know, what, 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 you know, where, you know, the in, in, where you took your data uh, from, okay? And you rerun the notebook, okay? You know, you know, you can see what's happening, okay? Any questions about it? So it's important to think about the, um, that, 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 that you might have to redo your analysis, okay? And you need to build your pipeline so that to support redoing the analysis. Any questions? Okay, it's a little, okay. When you're building your data programs, what other, actually, no, let me try that, boom. What other things are, are interesting? Well, typically, you you know, there there's certain data formats you should be aware of, okay? Whenever possible, okay, uh, it's good to use a data format that somebody else uses because there's some tools and stuff that are based on it. Um, the, most, the most common, um, let's say, data format and data science is just sort of the CSV file. CSV stands for comma-separated file. And this is what um, one of the formats that spreadsheets like Excel, okay, will, will take data in, okay? And um, so, in general, if you have a data table, a TSV or a CSV file is the right way to go. Um, but make sure that the spreadsheet can read it. Okay, one thing is that 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 just separating your elements by commas does not make it a comma-separated file. What happens if your data has text data in it and there's a comma inside one of the phrases? That can easily mess things up unless you have the right escape convention or the right quote convention, okay? So typically, if, if I have somebody who's giving me a CSV file that I think is important, I make them open it in Excel. And if they can't open it in Excel, it's not a CSV file. Any questions? Um, what other formats are important? XML is a good format uh, for... for representing non, you know, structured data that isn't really a table. Has anybody here ever used XML? Okay, some people. What's great about XML, if you do it right, is that there's a specification you're giving and that, you know, that, that you can actually check to make sure there are tools that check whether or not your file is really an honest-to-God XML file according to the specification. It's not just that you slap tags around things. Okay. Any questions? JSON, I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with. That's the JavaScript object notation. Um, now, this is something a lot of APIs use to transfer data back and forth. People will often save files of in JSON format. Okay. What's good about that? Well, any program that takes JSON as input, you can you can reconstruct it. What's bad about JSON files? Is anybody, is there anything that's unpleasant about JSON files? It's hard to, it's hard to visualize it compared to the Yeah, one thing it says is you can't read it, okay? At least I can't read it, you know, because they're so self, it's so self-descriptive you can't read it. It's kind of a funny thing because, you know, you, you know, you have all the field names and it obscures kind of your ability to eyeball it. That's one thing. 
Obviously, it takes up a lot of extra space if you have a really big file, okay? But, you know, but again, if it's often you need to communicate. If you have multiple tables, there is no shame in, in doing data science on an SQL database, okay? And so if you have a lot of table data with multiple tables in it, often that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. Any questions about the formats? Okay. Now, the question that, that comes up often is where do you get data from? Where does data come from? Um, and, you know, when you do your projects, your, your real project in here or in a typical job, you are going to need to find a, um, what you call it, a, a, a data set that uh, is appropriate for you to work with. Um, and finding it is often, you know, a little bit of an art. One reason why finding the best data set for you is that um, often the data set that you really want for your project is going to not have been created explicitly for your project. And it's often part of the project that people didn't think was very important. So in natural lang language processing, one thing that, it, or in studying, let's say, like social networks and things like that and how people communicate, one data set that has proven surprisingly often are the um, edit histories of Wikipedia pages. You know, that when you, when, when you look at Wikipedia pages, there are discussions between one Wikipedia editor and another Wikipedia editor. Get a load of this piece of junk the guy edited. Ha ha ha, that's terrible. Let's, let's delete it, okay? All these kind of discussions, okay? Where do you get discussion data about people discussing with each other, okay? Often these data sets are private. Often the data you might want might not be available. But if you go and look, think carefully, sometimes what you want is kind of in the metadata of another project, okay? Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, like, for example, in, in finding annotations for images, you know, the captions in news data has proven to be kind of an important thing. Often data comes with metadata, which is kind of describes the thing that they thought was what they were important. Wikipedia thought it was in the um, article, you know, the, the encyclopedia business and the articles that they were important, important. But for a lot of studies of how is it that people edit things, how do people, you know, the, the other metadata, like what the editors are actually doing. The interesting thing about Wikipedia is every change to every article since the beginning of time is available if you want it, okay? And so learning to think about data sets where they have the right data or metadata for what you want to do. That is, that is where things, I think a lot of the cleverness in data science comes up when you find a data set that, that does what you want. Any questions? So how do you go about looking for data? Um, there are, um, the, the, the first dumb thing you should do I guess, is Google does have a data, a data set search um, toolbox, okay? So if you want to say, oh, I want a data, set of, a data set about aardvarks, you could conceivably look something up there, and maybe you'll get something, okay? Now, this is every bit as uncurated as anything else on Google, okay? And so, you know, um, I was, you know, this morning I went there to tell you, oh, what, what could I use as a demo? So I typed my name in their search box. And I discovered some group had, from this class many years ago, they had left their data set on a web page and that got sucked into their search engine, okay? Did they do a good job? Did they do a bad job? God knows, okay? Any questions about that? So if you, th so, so on one level, Things that are on the web are often, but not always, accessible from that. But data comes from a variety of different sources. And I'd like to try to think a little bit about who is it that generates or, or assembles data sets? 
and what kind of things are available to them. The first sort uh, idea that most of us come up with, at least in, you know, what I would say is the kind of questions computer scientists typically ask, is there's often a company that collects the data, okay, and man, wouldn't it be great if they would give us this data, okay? If you think about Facebook, I would love to be able to analyze, um, you know, I, I've done research on social media at some point, wouldn't it be great to look at everybody's web, uh, Facebook posts, okay, and make, make, do various analyses of who's connected to what and all that kind of thing? Well, what's the problem? Unless you're Mark Zuckerberg, you can't look at everybody's Facebook data, okay? That, uh, that, that, that many companies have, um, you know, again, companies like Google have a lot of data inside, okay? Amazon, it would be wonderful to look at you know, what kind of people buy certain products, what products get sold. There's all kinds of things that would be very exciting. The trouble is that usually there are internal um, standards that kind of make it, first of all, getting outside people usually don't get access to inside data. And often even inside people don't get access to inside data. I, I spent a sabbatical at Yahoo a few years ago. And I was astonished how hard inside the company it was to get data, even when they were in the research lab, even when you worked for these people. Okay. So, um, you know, so this typically companies have a lot of interesting data. Often it's hard to get at. Sometimes companies will produce APIs that will let you get access to some of their data. So Google and Twitter are good examples of this kind of thing that there are some levels of, of API access you can get. Usually not as much as you would like, but that's life. Any questions? Of course, if you have money, money solves a lot of problems, and you can often get other data by paying for it. Any questions? But I think we established before that uh, you guys don't have money. OK, yes. Can you like legally scrape, uh, scrape public data if you're not using it for commercial purposes just for fair use? Okay, so, so one thing we will talk about in here, but I think maybe uh, uh, okay, I will talk about web scraping in a few minutes. Uh, let me talk about scraping now, since uh, let me, let's talk about it then. But I mean, the question was about scraping. Is it legal to go to some company's web page and um, and uh, scrape it, you know, first of all, every company will have often a terms of service of their data. Okay, if you look on the website, there will be some kind of um, statement about what you're allowed to do with their data. Okay, in fact, you know, um, we, we, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes they are relatively restrictive about what they want you to do. Um, there's a question of can you, for non-commercial purposes, scrape something? Well, if you violate their terms of service, the answer legally is no. The question is, will they arrest you for it? Okay. And the answer to that is usually no, if you don't try to sell it. Okay. But I'm not giving you legal rec that That's not a legal claim that says go ahead and scrape whatever you want. Okay. Any questions? Talk a little more about that later. Um, okay. Now, another source of data that uh, is, is important are government data sources. Um, if you go to the federal government, if you go to a website called data.gov, there you will find, um, when I last I looked, there were 100,000 data sets that were openly available. Governments are often supposed to share their data. Okay, when they can, they're supposed to share, share, share your data. You as taxpayers are supposed to be able to get access to things that the government produced. Um, and they, they, they will often, you know, in, in domains of how governments work, you know, it, usually they will make available what they can. Okay. And, you know, it's often interesting to think about whether or not the government is collecting data in the domain that you care about. Okay. Um, and, you know, usually, 
you, you will be surprised at the kind of stuff that's there. I told you earlier about the taxi cab data. The taxi cab data came from where? It came from New York City. And why was it released? Well, it's because the Taxi and Limousine Commission, uh, you know, individual taxi owners aren't going to want to give you their data. They are a private you know, entity. But the Taxi and Limousine Commission decided that it should collect this data. And once they collected it, well, unless there's a good reason why not, they might very well release it. Um, one thing is there is a law called the Freedom of Information Act that basically permits people to request data from the government, okay, uh, if they haven't released data on something, okay? And the rules are basically that unless there, if there's a request filed under the FOI, okay, unless there is a good reason like privacy, okay, the government has to release it. Actually, just the other day, I was a subject of an FOI request for the first time in my life. Okay, that's that someone at uh, there is a, someone at, outside wanted to request some some data from the university, and the university is a New York State thing. Okay, it's governed by the you know laws of New York State, and it's not the same as Google or somebody else, right? And you know, they, they, you know, I was informed by the university that some of data about me is going to go out up because of this request. And that was just a, a courtesy. The university has to release this subject to things. Usually privacy preserving is one of the important things. So you shouldn't file a, uh, you know, so, so there's limits to what you can ask for. But recognize that universities, that, that, gov that the governments have this data and do have to release it if asked. Any questions? Okay. Again, asking may involve a legal operation, by the way. So, uh, so it's not something you you, you know you, you do casually, but recognize that that's a possibility. Academic institutions. I'm talking about the research end of a, of a university. Okay. Um, what you call it? Uh, often make data available. You know, these days, again, I work in natural language processing. You know, people are very, you know, when you, you, you do a, a study like this these days, the referees are always hammering, oh, is that your data going to be released? We want people to be able to reproduce what you're doing. Okay. And so, you know, so you can often find a lot of interesting data sets that are released by, um, you know, by, by, you know, academic, you know, academic teams. Um, and so if you wanted anything that was on, um, I will say, you know, the, you know, anything in science, anything in economics, anything in history, okay? Anything, you know, we have, a, you know, there's a geography department at many universities. There is a lot of kind of, the, of interesting things out there if you know where to look. Now, how do you look for, a, you know, academic data sets? Maybe they will slither into that Google search engine. But, you know, it may very well be that, that the faculty member will, you know, kind of just say, oh, I've got, uh, what you call it, I'll, I'll release it if somebody calls me. Okay. So one thing to do is you find a paper that is studying, papers that are studying different things that, that uh, things that are related to what you're interested in. And if it looks like the guy had some data, okay, don't be afraid to send him or her a, an email saying, oh, I hear, see, you've got a data set. Can I have it? Any questions? Okay. Um, okay. Now, there was this question about, uh, again, uh, Scraping. Scraping is the art of taking a, a web page and extracting data from it. Okay. And so one thing is it's true is a lot of data in the world is kind of implicit in web pages. A lot of web pages these days are generated basically on demand from calls to databases. So one way to kind of get somebody's data is to repeatedly make 
web calls to them, have it appear on a fake web page and have your program download that page and scrape it to take the data out. Um, and scraping it can be a good way to get data on certain things. Um, you know, uh, I guess the first time I did scrape a lot of scraping was I was interested in a um, gambling, building a gambling system for a sport called High Life. And there was a stadium that would tell you who was playing. You know, there was a the place where it would play would tell you um, what players were playing every day, who was playing who, and for the one, matches the, the day before, how much, who won and how much money did it pay on the bet. And in order to build a database of these things, we wrote a program that every day would go to these websites and, and scrape that data. Okay, and after a year, we suddenly had a big, big data set. How do you go and build such things? Well, the first thing to know is that there are um, library functions in Python that make um, scraping easier. There's one, one package in particular called Beautiful Soup, I think it's called, okay, that has a lot of utilities to make it easy to scrape. I mean, on some level, HTML is just, you know, an XML-like data. You have to download it on your computer anyway. Instead of it getting interpreted and viewed for your eyes, there's no reason why you can't have a program that does the analysis of it. Um, what should you be aware of when you're building these scrapers? One, sometimes people will go, all, go out and write these scrapers to, to hit web pages and hammer the web pages. Um, while, they're, while the company may have already made an API available, often if, if, if you have a, 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 a place where, where they know that a lot of people are scraping it, um, they may say, well, it's easier for us if people just access an API rather than, you know, actually make us create all of these web pages, just have an API to get the data out. So you should check whether or not there is an API. And before you write your own scraper, you may want to check to see if anybody else has written a scraper. If you want to scrape data from a, a popular web page, it is probably something somebody else has done. And there's this world of Python libraries and things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, often you can go off and do that kind of thing. Any questions? As far as legality, again, there's this question of, um, you know, on every website, there's going to be a terms of service, okay, and that will tell you what you can and can't do. Um, you know, typically, if you're not hammering them too hard and you're not distributing the data, nobody's going to prison, okay? Um, one thing about scraping is it's important to be polite about the scraping. Okay, and that uh, typically one of the things that they will ask you is don't make more than one request per second. Sometimes a bad, a bad scraping, a bad, be, you know, be, behavior would be, I'm going to go and keep, uh, I'll write, you know, I want to get all of Amazon's data about books. Okay, and I'm going to go instead, I'm going to go get, I'll rent 10 Amazon machines. And I'm going to go have each one of these things simultaneously hammering Amazon, okay? And I'm going to make a million queries a minute and stuff like that. Typically, that's bad because if you have a web server, obviously, if you're getting a lot of queries, it hurts the behavior, it hurts the performance for other people, okay? And often, these website companies will have something where they're looking to see, you know, who is hammering. What you're calling a scraping mission for academic good, they're calling a denial of service attack, right? And they will quickly block you, okay? One way to, to avoid getting blocked is to not hammer them so hard, okay? And so, you know, one query per second is often enough that you kind of fall into the cracks here. Any questions? And of course, if you're willing to, one query per second, if you run it long enough, you will get all the data that you need. Any questions, so long as they don't block you. Any questions? 
Okay, good. The other thing is to note that for certain databases, I've had students, you know, one student came to me and said, oh, I want to write a scraper for Wikipedia, and I'm going to get all this data that I need from Wikipedia. And I said, well, that's, that's crazy, okay? Wikipedia knows people hammer Wikipedia a lot. Wikipedia is an open thing. Wikipedia makes available dumps of all the content in Wikipedia. The right thing to do is not to hammer the web pages and crawl over all the web pages. The right thing to do is to download it and then deal with it on your own end. Okay? So be aware that there are uh, often these things have big bulk downloads. Okay? And you should look for those before you immediately start to hammer. Any questions? Okay, I think that's clear. What other sources of data are there that's interesting? Well, one thing these days that is uh, amazing is that, you know, you know, a lot of different human activity, human and machine activity, generates data logs that are, um, you know, that are kind of not intended to necessarily tell you what's going on in, everywhere in the world. But, but by, by tracking what activities are going on on different machines, on different sensors, on different things, you can, you know, you, 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 you know kind of the aggregate of, of log data can be an amazing thing. Um, one, of my mo one of my favorite kind of clever studies that I heard somebody do was trying to, well, they wanted to measure earthquakes, okay? And they realized that each one of you is carrying in your pocket a, a little seismometer. A seismometer is this thing that's supposed to tell you where, how much the earth is quaking. And undoubtedly, there's one on campus in the geosciences department, okay, where they have this big machine nailed down to bedrock or something like that to detect when the work moves. You guys have phones. Your phone has an accelerometer. If there was going to be an earthquake here, is going to, your, your accelerometer is going to start to jiggle. And the question was, could you analyze the data from a lot of accelerometers and use it to tell when there are earth movements? Now, sometimes you're going to carry it, you know, people are going to carry around an accelerometer and they're going to do jumping jacks, okay? And the accelerometer is going to move without an earthquake, right? Mm -hmm. Or they leave the phone in their pants when they wash, put it through the dryer, and it's going to do all kinds of things but okay it should be clear that, that that with millions of cell phones you should be able to get great deal of coverage of a lot of things we talked in here about um gps about you know you, this the taxi data if you wanted to monitor how much traffic flow there is in the city okay the taxi data really does tell you that because it even, even on the resolution where we were talking about, where we just knew where each ride started, where each ride end, ended, and how long it took, that gave you some idea. But in some places, they stick GPSs on taxis, okay? And so you know exactly where the taxi is at any given time, okay? Analyzing that can tell you these things. So what can I tell you about sensor data logging? Okay, one is it's clear you can do amazing things with this kind of data. Two, it should be clear that um, storage for log data is actually amazingly cheap these days. You know, I can go down to Costco and buy, what is it, four terabyte drive, okay? And it'll cost me $100, right? If you have a website that you're running, there is absolutely no reason to log every single web click that you, was ever made on this thing, because you're not going to fill up that drive unless you know unless you're 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 really a big site, right? And it's often amazingly interesting to analyze that kind of data. Any questions about logging or anything like that? Yes. What is the format of the what?
Okay, so what is used to log? So the 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 you know the usual format or the best format for let's say general logs is often just an ASCII text file thing, where every um, event generates one line a one line record. You know, so typically you get column type data represented in a a text format. Okay. So I'm not sure that there, so this is one where for log data, it's often, um, you know, what you, what you want to do ideally is to produce something that is, is tabular, but you probably don't want to, I, I guess you're not building the log to um, manipulate. You're building the log just to accumulate the data. And typically what you will then do is if you care about analyzing it, your data munger is going to write some Python script that takes the log and then produces your Excel, you know, your, your Excel table, then produces something that, uh, that you can use better. So typically you've got, you know, the, the guy who's building the logging system has to use their judgments as to what, what, what fields are worth recording. Okay. But again, one thing that recognizes that unless, unless you've got a, a big system, okay, it's, it's often dollar wise storage is not that expensive. Any questions? Do any of you, uh, okay. Any questions about that? Let's just move on. What is another way that uh, people can can get data? Um, you know, one thing that's 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 an interesting phenomena of the model modern world is that a lot of data resources that are um, that are you know kind of built up by large numbers of people acting independently. Wikipedia, everyone knew about. Wikipedia was kind of this, uh, the idea that a, an encyclopedia could get built up by people, you know, kind of who didn't know each other, okay? That a reliable thing could get, get created by hundreds of thousands of people is kind of an amazing thing. Um, you know, if you can find somehow a way to make a lot of people go to work, okay, for you, entering data, this is a great thing. Many of you know about IMDB, that's the movie database. How did the movie database get created? Well, this guy said, hey, let's build a database of all the movies around, okay? And everybody entered in all the data that they knew about their favorite movie. And this was a crowdsourced thing and it was great. And then Amazon bought them, okay? And now, you know, uh, it's no longer maybe crowdsourced in the, quite the same way, okay? But it's an example of something big that got built up. Freebase was a database of, um, you know, kind of uh, a free kind of like knowledge graph of the world, okay? That there was a project and a lot of people would annotate this knowledge graph to be like Google. And this was great until they got sold out to, uh, I think they sold out to Google actually. Okay. So, um, but if you can get other people to build data for you, that's always a good thing. Now, the way that people typically, you know, ideally you get people to volunteer to build data for you, but that's tricky. An easier way to get uh, people to, to build data for you is to pay, pay them, okay? There are crowdsourcing platforms like Amazon Turk, where you can actually go and send a job that says, hey, type in this table from a book, okay? Here's the book, type in the numbers, I'll pay you 36 cents for doing it, okay? And if somebody is interested in, in, in that, then that's a good way to do it. Certain types of data, like in, you know, often um, for doing experiments, you come up with a world where you'd like to know, for example, if you were studying in natural language processing, you wanted to build something to tell systems that are, that are good at telling um, 
happy things from sad things. You need, people are good at reading a piece of text and tell, or people are good at looking at a picture and saying, if you ask the question, is this a happy picture or a sad picture? People could do this, right? You could pay people on Amazon Dark and they will annotate this kind of data for you. And then maybe you've got enough data to train a system to try to recognize happy pictures from sad pictures. Okay, any questions? So crowdsourcing is a good way of getting data for things like that. One way for getting data that I find never occurs to the students we have in this class is that you can actually type in some of these things instead of just going to pay someone on Amazon Turk. Okay. In many areas in graduate schools, people spend your, your, again, your colleagues in the life sciences or psychology will spend a lot of time actually collecting and gathering data. Okay. And, um, you know, and that's not really the, the custom seemingly in computer science, but recognize that, that, that this is something that you can do. Okay. And, um, you know, when, uh, what you call it? When, uh, in an example, again, that, that for some of the projects that in here, conceivably, you may find that all the data that you want exists in a book or a printout and not, um, you know, in a something you can necessarily download. If so, what could you do? Well, if you type in one record per minute, okay, if you want, want it, you can get a thousand records entered in only about two work days if you do it yourself. Okay, so recognize that this is a possibility that often in certain projects, people have to actually work for their data and that that's a perfectly respectable thing. Any questions? Okay, I think the final thing that I wanna just have us think about a little bit is, um. You guys on the first assignment here had to watch some of those videos, which may have been good, may have been bad. But in all of them, they were strange challenges that uh, were where, you know, where, where you needed to find some data about things. And it's kind of, I think, an interesting exercise to go through and see where, where there might be data for something. So where would you go for data about let's say baby weights, where would we expect to find it? If you wanted to try to build a model to predict how much a baby was going to weigh, you say maternity clinics? Now, it could be that you go to maternity clinics, but if you called the hospital here and said, I want your data on baby weights, what do you think they're going to tell you? Say no, okay. But is this data likely going to be available on some level? Well, there are academic studies, no doubts, of what causes people to have low birth rates. This would be a perfectly good thing. And so there probably are academics who have collected this kind of data, okay? In fact, that's where I think they ended up getting their data set from. Or maybe, actually, I think it actually comes to think of it, I think it came from a government source, okay? That again, a state may very well be concerned. They want their, and ideally the government wants their people to be healthy, right? And maybe they're gonna collect data on this in some central source, right? So I guess it was, in this case, it was a mix of government and academic type things. Where would you go to get data on the Super Bowl? Let's say you wanted to try to predict football games, American football games in this case. Where would you expect to find data on sports scores and statistics and stuff like that? Okay, so one thing is that 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 um, the league probably does have a website with some data on it, and probably you could scrape it. Maybe they have their statistics that they make available to everybody. Maybe you could scrape it. But probably there's also people who've probably scraped a lot of this because there's an infinite number of people who watch this kind of thing. So it would not be surprising if there is data sets that were collected, you know, already assembled by fans as a kind of a crowdsourced project, okay? There was some 
you know, some hobbyist who created this uh, a great data set. These kind of things are available. There probably are commercial services also for something like this. If you have somebody who, you know, who wants to be a gambler, they may want the most up-to-date data that they can get and they'd be willing to pay for it. Okay. Any questions? Um, let's look at one more here. What would be a good one? Where would you expect to go to get data on um, art prices? How much paintings sell for? What? Auction sites. So auction websites will have some data on this. Now, this is probably something that um, somebody, it's it, it, data that's interesting enough to people. And people who, people who are most interested in it are probably people who want to buy paintings and stuff like that. And they're rich. So there's probably people who collect this kind of data to sell them, right? So in this case, there's probably commercial services that probably also provide data like that. Maybe you could scrape recent sales on websites, could be other places. Okay, any questions about where data comes from? Okay, if not, then um, next class, we're gonna continue on cleaning and we're gonna, um, what you call, which, which is actually, I think, a very interesting subject. And um, we're going to talk more about the homework if you guys have questions about it. Okay, thanks for your attention. I will see you then.